bearing a pitcher of water, follow him into the house where he entereth in. This scripture is by far one of the most revealing of all the astrological references. The man bearing the pitcher of water is Aquarius, the water bearer, who is always pictured as a man pouring out a pitcher of water. He represents the age after Pisces, and when the Son, God's Son, leaves the age of Pisces, Jesus, it will go into the house of Aquarius, as Aquarius follows Pisces in the procession of the equinoxes. All Jesus is saying is that after the age of Pisces will come the age of Aquarius. Now, we have all heard about the end times and the end of the world. The cartoonish depictions in the book of Revelation aside, the main source of this idea comes from Matthew 28.20, where Jesus says, I will be with you even to the end of the world. However, in the King James Version, world is a mistranslation, among many mistranslations. The actual word being used is eon, which means age. I will be with you even to the end of the age, which is true, as Jesus' solar Piscean personification will end when the sun enters the age of Aquarius. The entire concept of end times and the end of the world is a misinterpreted astrological allegory. Let's tell that to the approximately 100 million people in America who believe the end of the world is coming. Furthermore, the character of Jesus being a literary and astrological hybrid is most explicitly a plagiarization of the Egyptian sun god Horus. For example, inscribed about 3500 years ago on the walls at the temple of Luxor in Egypt are images of the Annunciation, the Miracle Conception, the Birth and the Adoration of Horus. The images begin with Thoth announcing to the virgin Isis that she will conceive Horus, then Neph, the Holy Ghost, impregnating the virgin, and then the virgin birth and the adoration. This is exactly the story of Jesus' miracle conception. In fact, the literary similarities between the Egyptian religion and the Christian religion are staggering. plagiarism is continuous. The story of Noah and Noah's Ark is taken directly from tradition. The concept of the Great Flood is ubiquitous throughout the ancient world, with over 200 cited claims in different periods and times. However, one need look no further for a pre-Christian source than the Epic of Gilgamesh, written in 2600 BC. This story talks of a great flood commanded by God, an ark with saved animals upon it, and even the release and return of a dove, all held in common with the biblical story, among many other similarities. And then there is the plagiarized story of Moses. Upon Moses' birth, it is said that he was placed in a reed basket and set adrift in a river in order to avoid infanticide. He was later rescued by a daughter of royalty and raised by her as a prince. This baby in a basket story was lifted directly from the myth of Sargon of Akkad of around 2250 BC. Sargon was born, placed in a reed basket in order to avoid infanticide and set adrift in a river. He was in turn rescued and raised by Aki, a royal midwife. Furthermore, Moses is known as the lawgiver, the giver of the Ten Commandments, the Mosaic Law. However, the idea of a law being passed from God to a prophet up on a mountain is also a very old motif. Moses is just another lawgiver in a long line of lawgivers in mythological history. In India, Manu was the great lawgiver. In Crete, Minos ascended Mount Dicta, where Zeus gave him the sacred laws. While in Egypt, there was Mises, who carried stone tablets and upon them the laws of God were written. Manu, Minos, Mises, Moses. And as far as the Ten Commandments, they are taken outright from spell 125 in the Egyptian Book of the Dead. What the Book of the Dead phrased, I have not stolen, became thou shalt not steal. I have not killed, became thou shalt not kill. I have not told lies, became thou shalt not bear false witness, and so forth. In fact, the Egyptian religion is likely the primary foundational basis for the Judeo-Christian theology. 
baptism, afterlife, final judgment, virgin birth, death and resurrection, crucifixion, the Ark of the Covenant, circumcision, saviors, holy communion, great flood, Easter, Christmas, Passover, and many, many more are all attributes of Egyptian ideas long predating Christianity and Judaism. Justin Martyr, one of the first Christian historians and defenders, wrote, When we say that he, Jesus Christ, our teacher, was produced without sexual union, was crucified and died and rose again and ascended into heaven, we propound nothing different from what you believe regarding those who you esteem sons of Jupiter. In a different writing, Justin Martyr said, he was born of a virgin, except this in common with what you believe of Perseus. It's obvious that Justin and other early Christians knew how similar Christianity was to the pagan religions. However, Justin had a solution. As far as he was concerned, the devil did it. The devil had the foresight to come before Christ and create his characteristics in the pagan world. Fundamentalist Christianity, fascinating. These people actually believe the world is 12,000 years old. I swear to God. I actually asked one of these guys, okay, dinosaur fossils. He says, dinosaur fossils? God put those here to test our faith. I think God put you here to test my faith, dude. The Bible is nothing more than an astrotheological literary hybrid, just like nearly all religious myths before it. In fact, the aspect of transference of one character's attributes to a new character can be found within the book itself. In the Old Testament, there is the story of Joseph. Joseph was a prototype for Jesus. Joseph was born of a miracle birth. Jesus was born of a miracle birth. Joseph was of 12 brothers. Jesus had 12 disciples. Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Jesus was sold for 30 pieces of silver. Brother Judah suggests the sale of Joseph. Disciple Judas suggests the sale of Jesus. Joseph began his work at the age of 30. Jesus began his work at the age of 30. The parallels go on and on. Furthermore, is there any non-biblical historical evidence of any person living with the name Jesus, the son of Mary, who traveled about with 12 followers, healing people and the like? There are numerous historians who lived in and around the Mediterranean either during or soon after the assumed life of Jesus. How many of these historians document this figure? Not one. However, to be fair, that doesn't mean defenders of the historical Jesus haven't claimed the contrary. Four historians are typically referenced to justify Jesus' existence. Pliny the Younger, Suetonius, and Tacitus are the first three. Each one of their entries consists of only a few sentences at best, and only referred to Christus or the Christ, which in fact is not a name but a title. It means the Anointed One. The fourth source is Josephus, and this source has been proven to be a forgery for hundreds of years. Sadly, it is still cited as truth. You would think that a guy who rose from the dead and ascended into heaven for all eyes to see and perform the wealth of miracles acclaimed to him would have made it into the historical record. It didn't because once the evidence is weighed, there are very high odds that the figure known as Jesus did not even exist. We don't want to be unkind, but we want to be factual. We don't want to cause hurt feelings, but we want to be academically correct in what we understand and know to be true. Christianity just is not.